He said to me, see you next Tuesday. Fortunately for me, I had no idea what that meant. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark's Sunday interview. I'm your host, Tim Miller, and I'm here with my old buddy, my good friend, Robbie Kaplan. I told you guys on Wednesday that if if we lived in a righteous world, if we lived in a righteous country, uh, this would be the most famous lawyer in all of America. Um, but maybe not um, uh, for everybody who's listening. So I thought, Robbie, it'd be awesome if you just start by you know kind of talking about what you do um, you have a public interest legal firm, Kaplan, Heckler, and Fink. Um, you had a book, Then Comes Marriage, How Two Women Fought For and One Equal Dignity for All. We're going to get through your big cases. Um, there's a ton to talk about, including your deposition of Donald Trump. Um, but why don't you just start by talking to us about the, you know, kind of the firm and what the, what the idea was behind you know, this, uh, you know, this kind of public interest legal work. Yeah, so I, I've been a litigator my whole adult life. I, my nickname in law school was straight through that because I just, I was only a few people. Who <laughs> did, did they know? Were, they didn't know. I was were they not surprised yet. when you came out? <laughs> a little bit. Um, and so, but I had been a, a lawyer and then a partner a year earlier, I made mean, partner a year earlier at a big New York firm called Paul Weiss. Um, I'd gone to Paul Weiss because I wanted uh, to litigate. Um, it was the best litigation firm in New York. And I also was attracted to the fact that Paul Weiss had a very deep-seated commitment to public interest. And there was kind of a tradition at the firm of people like Arthur Lyman, more recently Jay Johnson and others, kind of going in and out of government service and going in and out of doing, you know, really mainstream, I mean, really high-profile uh, public interest matters. So, and I learned tons there, um, and it, it made me the lawyer I am today. Um, then what really happened to him, frankly, is... Uh, Donald Trump got elected president, um, and I thought that there needed to be a focus on Donald Trump by lawyers who were not only committed to public interest, but who had a background in commercial law, in commercial litigation, because as we all know, Donald Trump was engaged in a lot of commercial litigation in his past. Um, and I kind of had this crazy idea to create a law firm. Well, we back up. I thought that I was going to go work for Hillary Clinton's Justice Department, and that was going to, and then I was going to figure no. out what to do with the rest of my life. Um, that didn't happen. And then when yeah. the election we all had happened, plans that kind of went awry back around then. Uh. <laughs> um, and so they had this crazy idea to start this firm, and it was I call it a new fashioned old fashioned law firm because we're not solely public interest, and we have big high profile paying clients. I'm trying to think right now. I'm doing a case for Diageo, a liquor distributor. I have cases for Columbia University cases, you may admit we represent big companies all the time um, and rich individuals all the time. But combined with that practice, I thought it was very important to have a practice that was devoted uh, to doing cases in the public interest. And, and we like to divide our practice about a third, a third, a third, a third being kind of commercial litigation for traditional companies and businesses, uh, a third white collar cases, which my partner, Sean Hecker and his team do and then a third what I call public interest. Um, and uh, we really believed strongly that if you could apply the standard techniques of commercial litigation, kind of New York commercial litigation, to some of the activities that Donald Trump had been engaged in, that maybe you'd see some benefit, maybe you'd get your hand for some information that's ever seen the light of day. Uh, I was right on the merits. I was completely 100% wrong on the timing. <laughs> um, so we did bring those cases, um, but as everyone knows, Carol was only recently tried back in May, and we have a huge fraud class action against Trump that isn't going to be tried. Well, I hope it will be tried uh, starting January 29th. Um, well, I want to get into the timing stuff with you, too, because that's actually relevant to the criminal cases that he's facing. So we've got a ton, ton of stuff to talk about there. But let's talk about the ones that you've worked on on the civil side. Um, people are, are I, I seem more familiar with the Eugene Carroll case and the win there. So I do want to get to that. But let's start with this other uh, case that you're talking about, which is uh, uh, just for um, transparency, where we met. Uh, we've been ta you know, talking about uh, how to go after Trump on this case, me from the communication standpoint, you from the legal standpoint. Um, and uh, why don't just tell people from the start, like what this fraud class action cases because i think it speaks to kind of the heart of of what is horrible about donald trump that that gets lost a little bit 
Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, so at a certain point in time, um, people may know this from some other things that they've led. Donald Trump, essentially, it became impossible to continue his real estate business. And the reason for that is, or to effectively continue his real estate business. And the reason for that is in order to do New York City real estate, you have to be able to borrow huge amounts of money. It, that's the only way New York real estate developers do their business. And Trump, because of his prior bankruptcies and his not great record with other banks, he couldn't borrow the kinds of money, the amounts of money that he needs to do to continue that business. So at a certain point in time, largely coincident with Celebrity Apprentice, which kind of fell into his lap, he decided that the way to make money, and he was right about this, was to essentially market himself. That's what Celebrity Apprentice was. That's what a lot of these other kind of cockamamie businesses that you had, Trump Steak, Trump Water, uh, Trump University that I'm sure people know about. Um, and one of those money-making activities that he engaged in was to sell himself as a celebrity endorser. And he did that for an entity that still exists today known as ACN, or American Communications Network. Uh, it's a company based in North Carolina. Uh, it's a multi-level marketing scheme, known more colloquially as a pyramid scheme. And what that means is that in order to make money, if you engage in this, if you transact business with this company, you have to make the money not from selling any product like vitamins, or in this case, video phones. You have to make your money by bringing other people in to the network. That's the way you make money. The more people you bring in, the more money you make. So Trump uh, endorsed this company for about a decade period. He, he canceled his relationship or terminated his relationship only when he started running for president. And a couple of reporters, one at the Wall Street Journal and another guy kind of started asking questions. And he decided that wasn't probably a good idea for him to continue. But he made uh, well over $10 million. Uh, this entity, ACN, markets itself to very, uh, to struggling people, working class Americans, poor Americans, people who really want to pursue the American dream, uh, at least as they understand it, but they don't really have the resources or the education to do so um, in any ways, obviously, that Trump has done. Uh, so they kind of got wrangled in to this ACN multi level marketing scheme. Now, there's things that turn out to be super important about it. One thing, is ACN brought people in through these kind of stadium size convocations, almost like revivalist meetings, where hundreds and hundreds of people would come here, Trump in a, in a stadium somewhere, he would speak and he would get near universal adulation from the crowd, like insane right. amounts of cheering from the crowd. I happen to think it's not going to be directly relevant at our trial, but I happen to think that's where he became addicted to it. Like all the Trump meetings that happened after that, yeah. all the political things that he's supposed to, he became addicted to that kind of large stadium adulation yeah. to racing. So he, he was an exclusive sp spokesperson for a number of years, exclusive celebrity spokesperson. He um, spoke, he recorded videos that were used uh, consistently to bring other people in, and he spoke at these kind of stadium meetings. Um, his rise ranged from... Uh, just kind of what I would call just generic lies. This is a great company. I know business. I know real estate. This is a better investment than real estate. You can trust me, that kind of stuff. Yeah. To, I had a bunch of guys do due diligence on this company, and they looked at it, and they told me that it's great, one of the greatest investments you could make. To just flat out objective lies, like this company sold more, more video phones than any other company in the United States last year, just demonstrably yeah. flatly false. Uh, to my all-time favorite, which is people think I do this just for the money, but I oh, I do this because I really like the company. Um, and so we represent a class of really working class Americans. Our, our lead plaintiff, one is a, a hospice nurse, and another one was a furniture delivery, uh, delivery man. And they say that they were dubious about ACN, but they believed in Trump. They believed in Trump through Celebrity Apprentice and they bought into it and lost their hats, their shirts and their hats because of Trump. So that's the case. Um, the only other thing I should say is he had this company on, on Celebrity Apprentice twice, uh, one time for a bonus of a double header, a whole hour of Celebrity Apprentice. 
selling these insane video phones. And one thing to know about the video phones is these video phones were being marketed at a time when Skype and other software like that was already available on your smartphone. So there was no reason whatsoever. And these were huge phones that looked like almost like small computers. They had to be hooked to your phone. They had to be hooked into your electricity. And here's my favorite. You could only use the video phone if the person on the other end was also using an ACN video phone. Oh, my phone. God. So I mean, it would be nice. funny if it wasn't so nefarious and sad. I, the legal, so uh, I want I want to hear your kind of assessment of his legal vulnerability on this. But I, to, to me, like in my area of expertise, I think this has been the big failing of the anti-Trump efforts to expose just how, like the big lie before the big lie, the foundational lie about Trump was that he cares about the forgotten man and working people yeah. when he spent his whole life fucking these people over. Um, yes. I, I, that's like that, that to me is the foundation. And we tried to do a little bit of that in the 2016 primary, but I, to my frustration, I was a little bit too little too late and, and not enough of the ads were focused on that. And, and, and I think the Democrats have done not that great of a job of making that case. And then it's harder once he gets in there, there's so many other things to talk about so many other scandals. But so I, I just, I think that this is important, A, because these people's stories are important, but B, because it goes to the heart of his message. So anyway, I'm wondering your, your thoughts both on that and the legal prospects of this case as, as it comes up around the corner. Which is a part of the reason I think he is able to do that and the reason he gets all this support from people who think he's a huge success is frankly Celebrity Apprentice. I mean, Mark Burnett was brilliant at it. The show was brilliant. Even E.G. Carroll admitted on the stand that the show was brilliantly done. Um, and we have the outtakes actually from the two episodes that ACN was on and some of it will play at the trial. It's insane. It is literally insane. In what kind way? Because of... the... first of all, they're... everyone who was participating in the show from the celebrities to the ACN guys to Trump and his kids, they all know it's a scam. Right. So they're all talking off camera, knowing that this is a scam. Right. And uh, there are some excerpts where he's again with going to where I think it's his addiction, he's like talking to some of the celebrities about, no one can get more people into a stadium than I can, Star Jones. Right. Can you get 5,000? You know, it's crazy, though. Um, uh, and they talk uh, in, in the video, in the objects of the video, about how they're all going to use this phone at Trample work, and it was going to be really popular. They couldn't wait to get their hands on these great video phones. Suffice to say, I deposed various members of the Trump board, <laughs> uh, and that phone was never used. No one had ever seen it before. It was just all a big hoax. The other thing that was super interesting was we deposed some of the celebrities um, who were on the shows that, again, hawked these ACM video phones, including Mar I think I could say just her name, Molly Matlin. Yeah. Well, actually, because she's deaf, knows a hell of a lot about video phones. Because deaf yeah. people obviously have to use video phones. She's so the one who's on West Wing. She's on yeah, West Wing. Yeah, so she provided some very interesting testimony about whether these video phones made any sense whatsoever for anyone. Um, and again, I think a lot of that will come out at the trial. In terms of the prospects, I think they're extremely strong. And the reason is because it's all documented. All his lies are either in writing, on video, documented in plain English. We, I took a two, two, this deposition twice, one in this case and one in Eugene Carroll. And in this deposition, for seven hours, I just asked him questions in which he was locked in. Is this your signature? Is that you on the video? Who's the guy who you said did the due diligence? So he's locked in on everything. Um, and I can't, it's hard for me to imagine a jury not being persuaded. I mean, the facts here are just overwhelming. If we could persuade the jur a jury that was not exactly as Dahlia Litwick said, an avocado toast eating jury in E. Jean Carroll, right. that I'm very confident that we could persuade a jury in this case where the facts are really, it's not me said, she said, it's all, it's all documented. The E. Jean Carroll case was the one that had the one juror that was like a Tim Pool fanatic. Yeah, I've been talking about this. And, and it, because nobody ever brings this up. Whenever they're like, oh, it's biased, ju biased juries in the deep state. I was like, no, it's like regular people. Like this guy was a Tim Pool. I was a MAGA kind of a lefty-turned-maga podcaster. It's, just, it's crazy about it is the judge in this case, who I obviously think did a great job, but he, for jury selection, he does it like speed dating, honestly. Like, yeah. He goes around the courtroom, and you have like 40 seconds with each juror. It's nuts. And he asks the questions, and you don't even get to ask anything. And this guy who was, well, this is a crazy story, was wearing a white shirt, 
black pants and a black blazer. And when he, one of the questions Judge Kaplan asked him, what, where do you get your news? And everyone, including myself, including the court reporter, thought he said temple. That's what the transcript says. I actually thought he was made being all that Jew because he was what? <laughs> Does it go to temple? And then I think uh, someone from the Daily Beast, like three or four days later, figured out that he actually said Tim Pool. Tim Pool. Fair to say that we had a bit of a heart attack. Yeah. Um, we asked the judge to strike him. Uh, the judge brought him in for questioning twice and was satisfied that he could be impartial. Uh, so we stayed on the jury, and it was a unanimous jury verdict. So he definitely voted our way. Um, that's amazing. On, on the deposition, so which deposition was second? The Carol. Carol. So did he remember Carol. you from the ACN deposition? Oh, well, he did. Okay, I'm going to tell a story that's never come out before, but right. I think I can Exciting. tell the story. So at the end of the ACN deposition, yeah. where he was very frustrated because he'd been locked in all day on this, you know, really he had nowhere to move. Um, there, clearly he and his lawyers have been saying, talking about this, and he, immediately he started to talk, and someone said, off the record, off the record. So they made sure that the, the stenographer and the videographer had shut down the system. And he said to me, are you ready? Are you, well, you're obviously sitting down. Take a I'm breath. Right. He said to me, see you next Tuesday. Fortunately for me, I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> so I looked at him and I said, what are you talking about, sir? I called him, sir. So what are you talking about, sir? I'm coming back on Wednesday. Why would you tell him, sir? You're giving him another sir story to use. But anyway, okay. That's an... <laughs> we get into the limo. Uh, not the limo. Yeah, the to take us the black car to take us back because we get to have security and my associate so to me well do you know what that means and i said what are you talking about and they said see you next tuesday means excuse me cunt it was a, a, a yeah. popular term i'm sure you know tim that roger stone popularized about hillary clinton yeah uh, i'm very glad honestly that i didn't know what it meant because i i stayed calm in both definitions the whole time had i understood what that meant at the time i'm sure i would have lost my temper so then when he sees you, the next step... Say, oh, say it all, I call him mate. Find it on the record, find it on the record. And unfortunately, it wasn't on the record. record. I think I'll trust your word over his on that one. Uh, and so then when he does see you the next time for Gene Carroll, did, uh, you know, what was what was his mien like? I mean, was he like, this this fucking woman again? Like, what what was he thinking? We were aggressive, even more aggressive as possible toward me. So a lot of police said in that position were attacked, was attacked by me. Um, you're a disgrace, you're a half, um, you're, at one point he said, I'm not his type, he's sorry, he didn't want to offend me, but I wasn't his type either, things like that. No um, problem I, there, sir. I, I, I'm not, no, I, I wanted to say thank you, I did not. <laughs> um, I really stayed calm, I, I mean, you know me, Ted, I'm not known for my, you know, zen-like qualities, no. but I really stayed calm, and when he would do that, I would kind of look up at him and I would say, are you done yet? Because I have another question I want to ask. And then it would start all over again. Kind of how I, I treat my toddler during a tantrum, after a tantrum. Like, are you finished? Are you finished stamping yet? Um, okay, so uh, the we, we moved to the, the, the Gene Carroll case. Um, what? So now that we're, we're going after him again, what, how, where, what is the status of that case right now? So that case... Well, I, 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 obviously, there's been a... Yeah, right. Obviously, there yeah. was a result, but... Yeah. Well, he's done. We don't have to cover the issue of whether he sexually assaulted her again. That's yep. over. Yep. Um, but because of some complexities having to do with the first time that he defamed her, he was still president. Right. And that was all this whole host of complicated federal issues. That case was delayed. It went to D.C. Court of, uh, DC Court of Appeals and then came back. The total... That's what I'm talking about. The court's not moving so quickly. And so all that's left to do is to decide what were the damages to E.G. Carroll for the first time that he defamed her, which was in, Ju in June 2019. Um, those are the highest damages in the case because that's when the whole thing came out. That's when he was president. That's when there were, I think, something like hundreds of millions of impressions on social media. And so all that the, a jury has to do in that case, it should take more than two days, is decide what the damages were for that first defamation. Got it. Um, what uh, I want to go back to that deposition with Carol. Um, for the people who aren't familiar, some I'm sure some people saw this in the news, but like the epic moment from that deposition is when 
Um, he looks at a picture of her who he said is not his type and he confu- and he thinks it's Marla Maples. So just walk us through how that came to be and what is happening in your head as he just steps in this entire pile of shit. So, so the crazy part about it is uh, I can't say that I've never tried to trick a witness in a deposition. <laughs> that would not be true. I, yeah, <laughs> I might have done that the whole But that's not what this was. We were talking about um, when Eugene Carroll, when the excerpt of Eugene Carroll's book came out in New York Magazine in the summer of 2019, and he said, he volunteered that he'd seen a photo of her, of him with her. And I said, oh, okay. I said, I think I have that photo. And I asked my colleague, and I pull it out, and I say, is this the photo that you were just referencing? And that's when he literally, independently, not in response to a question, he looked at it, and he pointed to it, and he said, oh, that's Marla. And I said, Something like, what did you just say? <laughs> I was so shocked. And he said, Marla. Um, and then Alina Haba, his lawyer, immediately jumped in and corrected the record. But here's the thing that hasn't come out, which is great. I think it had a big impact on the jury. Then he was classic cop, because once Alina had clarified for him that it was not, in fact, uh, Marla Maples, his second wife, it was Eugene Carroll, he said, oh, well, I, the photos, I guess the photos just very blurry. So it was classic Trump. This is not a blurry photo. It's like a Getty <laughs> image photograph. The jury saw the photo. And at the closing, I said to the jury, that's classic Trump. That's what he does. He will lie about anything, anywhere, at any time, if he thinks it's to his advantage. He really made this mistake. It dawned on it. They made the mistake. So all of a sudden, the photo was blurry. Um, that was better than the original mistake in certain ways. I mean, the, the, the whole like element of it is like... Uh, you know, what, like, how did, does he find himself in this situation that he, you know, it's like the compulsive liar. It, like, reminds me of, I had a little phase when I was in middle school, I could admit to listeners, where sometimes I would just lie to my mother about things. She'd be like, what grade did you get on the test? And I'd be like, A. And I'm like, I know that in two weeks she's going to say it, right? But, like, I couldn't help myself, right? I had, I had a brief compulsive lying phase as a middle schooler. He has that at, like, age 70, 76, you know, Correct. and it's like, and it was, and that's what this was. I'd love to say it's like dementia and he's losing his mind or his glasses or something, but it's, but that is it. He's just has like this contrarian compulsive lying element. How'd you think about dealing with that as deposing him twice? For me, it's so fun. I, you know, and, and I think maybe it's probably one of the Eugene Carroll case, obviously, because he just can't help himself. Two other good examples for Eugene Carroll. One, uh, I asked him if he ever gone to Bergdorf Goodman, which by the way is two blocks away from Trump Tower and literally across the street from the Plaza Hotel that he owned for many years. And so and I, I asked a question and you can see the line kind of, it's kind of like a, a tornado. You can see it gather junk as it goes on. <laughs> so first he says, no, uh, maybe a little bit, but not very often. Then he says, no, now that I think about it, maybe my wife shopped there, but I never shopped there. And then he says, oh, no, no, no I never went into Booker Fitness. So we put on the stand at trial two former Bergdorf Goodman employees from that period in time, both of whom, one of whom saw him outside the store, and one of them, I think the other of whom was aware that he shopped at Bergdorf Goodman. Yeah. So again, it's like, and, it, and we didn't get into evidence, but in one of his books, uh, with the judge delighted in at the end, I think he thought, like, enough's enough, Robbie, <laughs> like, I <I'm there." laughs> but, but in one of his books, he says he recommends that people buy people gifts from Bert Durkin. So, uh, again, he just can't help himself. Yeah. Well, he probably didn't write the books. So it's just like also it's just like lie upon lie. And anyway. The other thing that really helped us is there's a famous interview that ended up being really important. Uh, it, let me back up. So E.J. Yeah. Carroll at this point in time had a TV show on Roger Ailes' first network called America Talking. Um, her sh- uh, she, the show was filmed at Fort Lee, which is where they had studios. And her show was broadcast as a, it was live, I think at four in the afternoon. And then they ran a rerun every night. I think she was on at 10 and Roger Ailes, who had his own talk show, was on at 11. So at a deposition, I say, were you friends with Roger Ailes back at this time? It was 1996. He said, no, only become friends with him in very recent years. Then at trial, we showed the video of Donald Trump being deposed by Roger Ailes in November 1995, so it's pretty quick, pretty soon before this happened. They're talking about their kill, and it's very clearly that they, at least on camera, are good friends. So being deposed, being interviewed on the show. On the being interviewed, I'm sorry, yeah. on her show, excuse me. Being interviewed on the show, and we show it to the jury, 
And we said he, he didn't know Eugene Carroll. Of course he knew Eugene Carroll. He knew because he was at the studio. He knew because when he watched the show at home, these were the old days, he had to walk, turn on the TV to that channel. Yeah, and right. if he was like a little bit early, he would see Eugene Carroll. Um, how is E.G. doing, I guess, before we move on for that? I would love to hear um, just kind of her mindset through all this. What a brutal process. And then, brutal, which she is literally one of the most courageous people I've ever met. She's doing great. She really said afterwards that she feels that way she got her name back. Um, she is kind of the incredibly charming, brilliant, eccentric writer you would expect her to be. And she just goes on and on doing what she does. It's amazing. I love that good for her. Okay, I want to get into some of the other amazing stuff that you've done. Um, you started the firm, I, might, I think I have this right, correct me if I'm wrong, like, like basically the first big public interest case you took on as you were leaving was this was this lawsuit um, uh, after the Charlottesville um, Unite the Right rally. And, correct. And it was pretty creative, I, I, I guess let's put it this way, had you not done it, like maybe nobody would have done it. Right, like it's not as if that there was somebody coming to you and saying, "Hey, oh, we need to make, we need to do this lawsuit." It was like you identified this as saying that these guys had. Well, you just tell the story. Talk about how you got into the Charlottesville lawsuit. Well, the Department of Justice, namely the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, which was started after in the twenties to deal with these very issues, should have done it. Jeff Sessions was on the AG. Call me crazy. I didn't think he was going to do anything about it. Yeah. Uh, and so it thought to me like someone needs to do something about what is obviously a terrible, violent conspiracy that violates the Civil War, the statutes that implemented the Civil War amendments. Um, so we dusted off, we were the first people to dust off the KKK Act, which hadn't been used successfully since the 1950s. They were really, they'd been used for um, kids who went, went on buses down south and then were killed. There have been a couple cases that were successful then, but it hadn't been used successfully since then. Um, and we dusted it off and brought a civil rights conspiracy against the leaders, the organizers, and then a couple of the foot soldiers, including the guy who drove into the um, into the crowd, Definitely. who engaged in the violence in Charlottesville. And, and at the time, this is what's so crazy about it. At the time, I I, I had no idea of two things. One that I was starting a vogue uh, for bringing <laughs> cases under the civil rights statutes. A lot of the laws, the cases today, including the Trump prosecutions, are brought under those statutes. Um, a lot of the January 6th cases as well, the civil this cases. Is a, this is kind of an important point. Let's just pause there for a second. So do you think that that, I mean, obviously it had a direct impact on that, right? I mean, like these guys are kind of searching around for 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 statutes under which they could charge Trump for these like obvious crimes, but that are unprecedented in a lot of ways. And, and so the fact that you were successful in Charlottesville, do you think that there was a direct line on using this statute? Yeah, I think it did. And, and some of the earliest suits, there were civil suits brought against January 6th, and those were all under similar statutes. Yeah, so, yeah I did. Um, so there was that. And then B, the, f the fact that the defendants in our case, so the first... Maybe for the first time I became famous. It probably wasn't the first time. But for the first time, we're able to use social media in a, to organize a violent conspiracy nationwide. Obviously, also ended up being a very big deal later, as we saw on January 6th. Right. Um, at the time, I had no idea. I was hoping it was going to be a one-off. I didn't think this was going to be a pattern. Um, but we did see in Charlottesville the ability... Well, let me back up. After these laws were passed, if, if people wanted to violate these, these civil rights statutes, they would they would don a white robe and a hood, and they would go into the forest in Alabama or Mississippi, and they would lynch African Americans. And today, you don't need that. All you need is the ability to get on your internet, get on Discord or one of these other websites with a hashtag. You have anonymity by definition. Yep. And you don't have to be local people in the in the forest of Alabama. These guys came from all over the country. Right. Uh, the the ability of people to to engage in this kind of conspiracy today. I'm not saying that was anyone's intent with social media, but using social media is petrifying. And again, same thing on January sixth. Yeah, this, it's interesting. I was I interviewed the head of the South Carolina Republican Party a couple of years ago. He's like was one of the remaining too conservative for me, but normal. 
types, you know, not a QAnon crazy. And this was something that he observed, right? When I was like, well, how has the South Carolina party gone so nuts? And he's like, because these guys can organize, you know, he's like, it'd be two people, you know, he's like, we always had these guys, there'd be two people in Spartanburg and two people in Columbia and two, right? But, but now it like makes it a lot easier for them all together. And he observed that, that that's how they were taking over local parties in South Carolina. So anyway, the Charlottesville case, um, I, I, so essentially, you sue the leaders and, and a couple of the foot soldiers in this. What, what do you think impact that had? Because that part now, Oath Keepers, there have been other groups that have still, you know, it, that still exists. Obviously, domestic extremism on the rise. But that specific Unite the Right, Alt-Right, Richard Spencer thing really has kind of fizzled since then. So like, don't, yeah. that, since then you've seen lone wolves, unfortunately. So you'll see yeah, right. people like yeah. in Pittsburgh, things like that, Poway, right. et cetera, that they're terrible. But they have not tried to engage, at least as far as I'm aware, since then, of kind of this mass violence that clearly was the goal of Charlottesville, and they accomplished their goal. Um, and I think it's because of the trial. I mean, we're going to, we finally have verdicts, we're on appeal, but we're going to bankrupt these guys. Um, and to the extent they have any money whatsoever, we're going to take every penny they have, including Richard Spencer, who definitely has money. Uh, yeah, he's still... He's still popping around on social media. I see him sometimes. Like he's trying to rebrand a little bit, kind of as a soft Nazi. Instead, he, he disavowed some of his earlier beliefs, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, bankrupting no Nazis, that's a win. Um, you know, getting Trump for sexual assault, uh, getting some money out of him is a win. Uh, so that's pretty good. Uh, but the big, uh, well, actually, I want to talk about the biggest win, I think, for, for us from a personal level, which was the, the Windsor case in front of the Supreme Court. But before we do that, um, before we get off Trump, I just I'm curious about just your legal expertise of of the criminal cases. So so we're looking at you know J the two Jack Smith cases, the Georgia case. You know the things that our listeners obviously care about is uh, what you alluded to at the beginning, timing. Like what is your just assessment? You know, just putting it outside or putting on your legal eagle hat for like whether you know it's possible that we might you know get some kind of resolution or some kind of action between now and, you know, the Republican convention. So she, I just took a big, big kind of intake of air. <laughs> you didn't the same. But look, I hope I'm wrong. Um, but given the circumstances that I'm aware of, I think the, the case that has the best chance may have the only chance of getting to trial before the election is probably the federal January, the Jack Smith January 6th trial. Um, the fornication of a judge who seems like she wants to slow roll things. You have all kinds of security issues that they're bringing up in terms of the documentation. That takes time. So I hope that can, that's in certain ways the easiest case to prove. Um, but unless you have a judge who's really moving to push it forward, that's going to be hard to get to trial before the election. Um, Atlanta, they're going to take at least six months, maybe a year, fighting about where the case should be should happen in the first place. Trump's going to say should be should be moved to federal court. That's going to take a lot of time. Um, and I'm sorry, I thought itself, federal court was bias. I thought the DC, I thought DC deep state was bias, and he wanted the in the states. That, that was likes, that's only in certain cases. In other cases, he wants it in DC. He moved DC? D. Jean Carroll to federal court, which was great for us. But yeah. that same thing. Um, so that's going to take time in Atlanta. And, and the conspiracy, while incredibly compelling, is very complex. A lot of yeah. defendants. That's a that's a big thing to try. Um, January 6th, you have a judge who's very experienced who moves things quickly, um, and you have a great prosecutor in Jack Smith. So I, I, that's where my hope is, but look, I hope I'm wrong. I've never so, so much wanted to be wrong in my life. Hey, but the merits of them, I mean, let's just of the three, um, you know, obviously there are different kind of views, but you feel like they're, they're, they're strong cases against him on the merits? Every single one of them. I mean, I think Ford is open and shut. I, I don't yeah. know what his defense could possibly be there. It's, it's and the fact that he was showing Iran battle plans to, to women at, at Bedminster is true, we'll say. Um, the other two cases are more complicated, but it sounds like they have such overwhelming testimony, all from Republicans, that it's going to be very hard, I think, for him to put out much of a defense. And the one thing, the one thing we still have in this country, and I sound a little bit Pollyannish, I don't mean to be Pollyannish, I but... Love this. Thing we have is when you can when you put facts forward in a court of law 
with the rules of evidence where you can't lie, or if you do lie, as in Carol, you can show the lies. I still have faith, especially from Carol, but juries are going to follow the facts in the law. And so I think even if for the, even if it's a jury that all voted for Trump, I still think the prosecutors have an extremely high chance of, of prevailing. So um, on the dumb and dumber, so you're saying there's a chance scale. Uh, what, what, uh, what do you think is the chance to like, you know, he actually goes to jail from one of these cases? I think his best chance of getting going to jail is, in, is the Atlanta case. The federal guidelines and the federal sentence for this stuff just aren't that severe. It seems to put a, a former president in jail is a, is a BFD. Uh, and it seems, I mean, it may happen, but it seems to be harder. So I shouldn't uh, leave I think, the champagne on ice, you don't think? Yeah, I wouldn't leave the champagne on ice. But he, I, I guarantee you that he's very scared of that. Yeah. For what, sure. You know. What do you think about um, one other thing on those cases? On, on the right, you're hearing now increasing, you know, agita over going after yeah. his attorneys in the Georgia case, you know, and um, and and all of the ramifications that go along with that. So as an attorney, has to make these choices. I'm, I, I was just curious what your thoughts are about about that. I mean, about Jenna it's, Ellis's exposure and, and Rudy and all those guys. I guess my answer is there are attorneys and there are attorneys. <laughs> Some people, most attorneys, I think, uh, feel an incredible obligation uh, to adhere to certain standards and to only uh, do acts that are legal and only recommend that your clients do things that are legal. And most of the time, 99% of those times, those lines are pretty obvious and you know when not to cross them. Um, and based with the allegations um, in the Atlanta lawsuit and in the dc lawsuit are true and i assume i have to assume they are those were not close questions uh those attorneys cross lines that any a first year law student would know not to cross why they did that i'm not a psychologist i'm not going to try to explain that uh but it's not an attack on the attorney client privilege or the attorney client relationship it's an attack on a, on a group of people got together and just decided to break the law uh, Jeff Clark, by the way, is, is long been one of my favorites because he's the guy who removed the Evening Carroll case to try to stall it uh, from state court to federal court on the theory that the government, the DOJ, should defend. He signed the original removal papers, the Westfall petition. So he's been on my radar screen for a long time. Okay, so while we're on champagne on ice questions, the Clark, Rudy, Ellis, like it seems like their exposure in Georgia is pretty, pretty real. Very real. And, and especially everyone in New York has been commenting, especially all the lawyers. Rudy Giuliani, when he was U.S. attorney, he was famous uh, for kind of reviving the RICO statute. And he right. was in against all those the people. Uh, the, the, the irony that that's today what he's been charged with is, is I don't even have an edge to describe it. Yeah. So the craziest thing about that with Rudy is if in 2002 he had just flown to Sicily, and and retired and drank wine and ate pasta and greeted visitors who wanted to come kiss the ring like we that you had have renamed LaGuardia after him and like here he is looking down the face of real jail time over a statute that he was famous for uh quite a quite 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 the story why is he volunteered to go to the Ukraine for Trump it's like he couldn't stand not to be in the mix that's gotta be it right it literally uh, makes no sense uh, yeah, I think that that the desire to be in the mix, um, which I've written about a lot, I think is a big part of it. Also, I think alcohol poisoning is probably not, not, not helping him. Um, okay, let's before I'm, I'm going to lose you here, so I want to I want to feel feelings. Um, we know the result of the Windsor case, um, obviously, which has been good for me. Um, uh, married and I have a child. I took to kindergarten this morning. Um, uh, what uh, what I just kind of want to go back with you to like when you met Edith and, and kind of like what was the origin story of that case and like how confident did you feel and just kind of just tell us that, you know, the short, the dime store version of that story getting to the Supreme Court. It's hard about kind of the randomness and maybe not so randomness of life. Uh, and what happened is I got a call from a friend of my wife's who was a head homer, did like legal head hubby, and who said, I know this woman, Edie Windsor, um, she uh, had to pay a huge uh, tax bill when her spouse, the Aspire, died, and she's been looking for a lawyer. The, the day groups have turned her down. Would you talk to her? Uh, when this friend of mine said that to me, he, I knew exactly who she was. It only came out after the case because we had put this in our brief. But 
the reason I knew exactly who she was is flash forward, flash backwards, excuse me, 18 years. When I was in my third year of law school, um, and it came out of the closet, I was and not so eager to come out of the closet, so I waited to the last possible minute. Uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to age you and say what year that was, but the last third year of law school is not too late. I'm about a, 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 unre a redacted number of years later, uh, I didn't come out till my mid-20s, okay? So I think you did pretty good. So, so what happened my parents came to visit me in New York, um, but yet it was my dad locked but it was gay pride, and so they kind of had to wind their way through gay pride traffic to get to my apartment. Uh, my mom got to the apartment and started kind of bitching. Uh, what's with these dykes on bikes? What's with this? What's with that? I said to her, Mom, please stop, as moms often do. She continued. I said, please stop again. She said, why? Why do you want me to stop? Are you gay? I said, yes. And in the most kind of like a bad Jewish suburban soap opera, she literally walked uh, to the corner uh, of the apartment and started hitting her head against the wall. Hmm. Um, she's a politician for this. I stormed out of Thanksgiving dinner, so we can do a whole separate podcast about uh, the, about coming out disasters and how stereotypical they were. So anyway, uh, we can go ahead to toe to toe. My mom is apologizing for two minutes, so this really isn't a criticism. I'm not forgiven. It's, that's not an issue anymore. Yeah, but same. And you can imagine I was feeling a little low that summer, and I started to ask around. I need to see who can I see as a psychologist who deals with gay issues. That's what he talked about it then. Deals with gay issues. Mm -hmm. And I kept getting the same name. The name I got was Thea Spire. So I actually saw Thea Spire every patient. I know that they saw her more than twice because I was moving to clerk for a judge in Boston in the fall. Then in those Leos, which were in, Thea was already uh, paralyzed from multiple sclerosis. So she, she was in a wheelchair. So you met in her living room. And then during those sessions, she talked about Edie. Here's the crazy part. I remember her telling me about this brilliant mathematician she was married to and how great their life to be, had been together. Now, I understand now that she was saying it to me because I, I was so despondent at the idea that I could ever have that, that she decided to tell me to make, to give me confidence. It was a good thing that she told me. But flash forward 18 years and I get this call, I call Edie Windsor and she's like, okay, why don't you come over? And I said, okay, I didn't have to ask her where she lived. I knew exactly where she lived. <laughs> I walked into the apartment. It was like going back to the scene of a, an accident, kind of. I was like, oh, my God. Um, and I told her the story. He wasn't that interested in the story. She's like, let's talk about my case. I was like, fine. And, and that's how it happened. Um, I knew, I, I thought that Edie would win her case, at least through the Second Circuit. I, I thought her chances were really good. Americans understand taxes. They really understand unfair taxes. And the idea that she would pay all this money just because she was married to a woman rather than a man seemed to me, you know, that, that fundamentally unconstitutional that I thought we'd prevail. But I didn't know at the time, I knew that one case would ultimately get to the Supreme Court, but I didn't know that it was to be our case. I thought we'd be done at the Second Circuit. Right. Um, right. And it just so happens that that's the case they chose. How? Do you, what? Basically, what happened is the Solicitor General decided early that the, the Supreme Court should get involved. So he did this thing then that was very rare, today it's very, not rare at all, called cert before judgment, which is where you ask the Supreme Court to, to decide an issue before it's gone to a circuit court. And again, it was, they did it like once every five years, six years back then. Today it happens multiple times a session. But, um, and they wanted to get, rightly so, wanted to get decided. Originally they had picked a case out of California because our case in the fall was still at the trial court. We then got a decision from the Second Circuit that was on exactly the grounds that the Department of Justice thought were the right grounds. And so our case went from being number four, four out of four in the rankings, to number one. And that's why the Supreme Court, they followed the SG's recommendation and took our case. Um, and, uh, you know, talk me through um, Victory Day. You know, what, uh, just like, what was it like when it came down? You know, did you go get a margarita after? Um, just give me the it's full deal. So we were in New York City. The Supreme Court does this. Most other countries' top courts actually tell people when their decision is coming down. Right. But why would they do anything that's that nice or less sadistic than our? But they do not. Right. So they have these decision days in the it summer. It wasn't the starting... last day. I assumed it would have been the last day. It was, but we, it could have come down for like three or four days before that. So right. three or four decision days or that, we all got together in my apartment because it, it was a hot summer and had the best air conditioning. <laughs> 
We all gathered around the my dining table with our laptops on SCOTUS blog, refreshing, 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 and let's see what's going to happen. He got very frustrated. At a certain point, Ari Levy's article in New Yorker says he said, fuck the Supreme Court, which he did say. And she was saying it about that. She was like aggravated that she didn't have a decision. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, finally, it was the last day. She was like, I'm not even coming. I said, no, Levy, you're definitely coming. Um, and we're doing the same thing again. So like a third or fourth time. And the minute we saw that uh, decision was by Kennedy and that the dissent was by Scalia, we didn't yeah. even have to read another word. We knew we'd won. Uh, There's this great photo of it. We had a photographer there of complete insanity broke out in my apartment. I'm screaming. My wife is crying. Um, and then Obama called a few minutes later to congratulate Edie from Air Force One. I think she she hung up on him by mistake at least once. <laughs> uh, so, and then, like, the rest of the day, I mean, he loved it. She deserved it. And she loved it. She was kind of riding around the city of New York in a like... I don't even know what celebrity to compare her to. Like, we would drive down the street. People would come up to the cars to little touch little mini her. ticker tape parade type thing. It was insane. And there was a big, we had a big celebration of Stonewall. What was the um, expectation? Like, were you, you were worried it was going to be 5-4 either way? Was that the, was it just Kennedy? Or what was your level of confidence? Yeah, we thought it was 5-4 either way. Uh, we thought we had Kennedy. Well, I can't breathe. Everything we did was written to appeal like Justice Kennedy. Like yeah. we cited it. He's like, he'd written all the gay rights cases at that point, so we could cite his own cases. But, um, but during the argument, the Chief Justice was particularly irked with me, I think it's fair to say. And we took that as a signal that he knew that we had Kennedy, that he realized that he was on the losing side. So we were pretty nervous, but why was he? Thought, was Roberts then? It was Roberts then. Still, yeah, right? he voted. Yeah. He dissented. Yeah, why? But why was he irked with you? Because he realized that we had Kennedy. Oh, got I it. I think that's the way we read it. I mean, we had, there's no way to know it's like reading tea leaves, but that was our yeah. best guess. Um, well, that's beautiful. I wish I was there with you, and uh, we all uh, a grateful gay nation thanks you. Um, okay, last thing. I, I had to, this is a pet one for me, and so I've, I've never talked to you about this. Um, but you guys also at, at your firm did the uh, uh, NCAA in a kind of gender equity review um, and, and a bunch of other stuff. And so I just kind of wanted to get your a position from your standpoint. I like, I'm of the view, I, I think that women's basketball in particular, but other women's college sports are like really on the cusp of kind of taking off into being very big. And I don't know that people appreciate it yet. Like in the way that women's tennis is because of the way that men's sports in college besides football are going to get smaller because the really good ones are just going to skip to the pros. Um, and that's not that's true because with NIL now, like girls basketball, like the good girls can stay around for four years okay. and build a relationship with communities and like, you know, all that. And so I, I do think it's, too. yeah, on exactly. the cusp. And, but it, it feels like, like the NCAA has like utterly failed at <laughs> these athletes in like a million ways. So anyway, I was just wondering what your big takeaways were from your kind of review of all that. So first big takeaway, we hired an economist to be in the analysis. So is exactly what you just said, was that, you know, one of the arguments for not having equal treatment for the final four was that men earned so much more and that was so much more valuable. Yeah. And I finally, when we got assigned to do this, I was like, we just need to know the truth. I don't know what the truth is. Yeah. I'm not an economist, but I'm hiring an economist to tell me the truth. And we didn't, he just kind of did an analysis and he concluded exactly what you said, that the, the growth potential for women's sport, women's basketball and other is just ginormous. Um, and it's not being exploited, and the TV contracts alone are worth a fortune, and that the NCAA has to pay a lot more attention to that. The contracts are for, no, I think, in a year, and they are paying attention to it. So that's good, um, and there's a lot more money that's going to be coming in. So basically, the way the NCAA, to, uh, to NCAA was divided up, it was men's basketball and then everything else. And it was kind of nuts to like just have a men's basketball contract, and then everything else is part of one contract. So I think that's all going to get divided up, and the NCAA is going to get a lot more money, and that's a good thing. And second of all, and this was the year they had the Final Four during COVID. Right. So the men are in Indianapolis, the women are in Texas. And just stupid, I mean, I don't know how else to put it, just stupid stuff. Like the men were getting like steak and lobster buffing dinners, and the women were getting dinners that looked like what you'd get on a, on a plane. Yeah, in jail. With a little bit of, yeah, and not even a lot of food, like <laughs> a little bit of salad. Like, it was crazy. And, and, and I don't think, again, it was intentional. I just think it was the way men were seen as the kind of the premier brand. Um, but obviously that's not okay. And so we pointed out a whole bunch of different things. 
it's my understanding that but then much of it has already been corrected yeah i think there's um, gonna be real but, progress on that front did you look at all into the pay for the kid or that or had nil not happened yet when you did the report and i know had just been passed but had not yet yeah. yeah there's the, the big drama for, for the girls sports now among nil is pretty girl privilege which is um, like, like you know, like on Instagram you can do. It's like my whole thing. If you get brought back to do to do another review, is like they need to figure out a way to divide the pie. They're like making too much money to not not divide the pie a little bit a little bit better. This is Bernie, socialist Tim, former Republican socialist Tim, is coming out a little bit. Lawyer, because there's no fortunately there's no pretty girl nil in in the law. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, I think you had done pretty good. Um, Robbie, this has been so, so marvelous. What my final question for you is, you've just been a dog on the bone with Donald Trump since 2016. So I think maybe what we connected over, you know, I was maybe a little more complicit than you, but you had to have the life change. We're like, we've got to beat this fucking guy. It's now about eight years later. It's still going. These cases are going to go. He's going to have the election in 24, but these cases are going to go into 25. When, once he's finally whatever, whether it's jail or, or just not presidenting uh, or, or or whatever, are you, you know, are you moving to the Hamptons? Are you just get? Are you just? Are you, do you get to retire and take a break? Do you have a? Are, are you? Are you? Do you see a light at the end of the tunnel in the post-Trump world? Or are you just focused on, on just squeezing him for every penny he's got first, and then we'll see what happens. Fortunately, there's just we have too many. Problems. How many of us thought? I grew up in the '80s. I'm older than we have been. And I never thought there were up during the Reagan years that I would be living in historic time. I really did. I thought, like, we were going to have bad 80s music and, like, there would be gay rights. That would be good. But it was generally everything was going to be relatively normal. Yeah. I don't think we're living in normal times, frankly. And I think there's just too much work to do. Um, even once Trump is finally defeated, which I think will happen, the, the danger of social media that we touched on earlier is petrifying. Um, and something has to be do, done about it. You can't have, for, to give just one example, young girls starving themselves to death because of Instagram. That's just insane. And so, like, I kind of was born to be a fighter. So I, as far as I know, probably my family's not happy about this, but I'm going to keep on fighting. I love you, Robbie. Thank you so much for taking the time. You're so busy. You've been very generous with your time. Um, get back out there. Just kind of squeeze that motherfucker. Take his money. <laughs> Um, we appreciate you. We're all grateful to you. And uh, I hope to see you next time out through New York. Thanks so much. Take right. care, Tim.